This morning, it's a great pleasure to have with us Reverend John Molina Moore, General Presbyter of National Capital Presbytery. National Capital Presbytery, as many of you know, is the regional organization in the Presbyterian Church that facilitates ministry among our congregations. As our churches in this region begin to discern what church, if you will, in quotes, what church will look like, what it will feel like in a post-pandemic world, we face an opportunity to consider what it might mean to come back to a better normal. We're seeing data that is showing that most, most active church members are not excited to return to just the same old business as usual, picking up exactly where we left off a year and a half ago. On the other hand, Christians are looking for a different emphasis. We want to discover ways to strengthen our spiritual lives, something many of us have been too busy for the past 15 months to attend to. This morning, we'll explore what a spiritual returning to church could look like through the unique lens of what it means to be Presbyterian Christians. The Reverend John Molina Moore earned his BA at Sterling College and his MDiv at Princeton Theological Seminary. At Princeton, he won the Gerald R. Johnson Award in Speech Communication in Ministry, which is awarded in Preaching and Communications. He also holds a certificate in Advanced Executive Leadership for Ministers from Howard University. And prior to accepting the call to his current position, John served pastorates at Red Clay Creek Presbyterian Church and Calvary Presbyterian Church, both in Wilmington, Delaware. Most recently, John served Northminster Presbyterian Church and Western Presbyterian Church here in our presbytery in interim positions. John is an energetic, capable, inclusive, and visionary leader. He was our guest preacher at National a year ago, earlier this month on June 7th. And this morning, John, we say, welcome, welcome back. Glad to have you with us. Good to be here, Quinn. Thank you for the intro. I, I, that was a year ago that I was there. That felt like, you know, 15 years ago, how time moves through a pandemic, right? Well, it was a different era in many yes. ways. <laughs> Ah uh, yes. Uh, well, friends at National, it is it is a uh, a pleasure to be with you all um, this morning. I want to give you some uh, words of caution before you get too ruffled up and in, in, into seats. Things we're going to be talking about today are are by no means a um, casting on what has been or what might be going on around our church, especially here in the Presbytery of of the good work that the, the saints that came before the pandemic um, have held up and done. But I think, I don't think, I, I, I know that we are in a very unique opportunity right now as the church um, to be able to really respond. How is it that we are going to um, continue to, to, to live into the calling that we have all been placed, placed on all of us to go out and to grow God's church, right? To, to share the gospel to, to every corner of of this beautiful earth that, that we can possibly reach. Um, so the way that we are going to do that post pandemic is going to feel, um, it's not gonna be different, it's gonna feel very different from a lot of the work that we might have done before um, in terms of how we engage the community and the people around us. So I, I wanna start today with, with, with a couple of stories. Um, in my own faith journey. Um, so as I'm sharing mine, I invite you to, to think about yours and to go back into the pieces that, that drew you into this faith. So I grew up in, in San Jose, California, and I went to a, a summer camp pretty much every summer um, that was out in the Redwood Forest, kind of, you know, led, led by hippies, Presbyterian Camp and Conference Center that's, that's still up and running today. And around middle school, right, end of middle school, beginning of high school, the time when I'm going to be confirmed back in my home church and become a member of Foothill Presbyterian Church, I'm at camp. And the, the experience that I am having at camp, the, the, the week there, of being able to understand who I am as a child of God, what my journey of faith is going to be like, involved getting my hands into the dirt, right? It involves sitting in silence 
It involved um, singing songs that I did not sing back in the sanctuary at home. It involved doing prayer in, in ways that felt very different than what happened in the red pews inside the sanctuary or in the wooden chairs on the Sunday school classrooms at my home church. So I had this camp experience, you know, from through childhood. And it wasn't until this kind of middle school, high school moment where I started to have this cognitive dissonance about what was happening back home in the pews and in my youth group room, my Sunday school classrooms, and what the experience that I was getting from camp. And I, of course, didn't have language and words to put into what that dissonance was and felt like at, at 14 years old. But as I look back on it, it was because camp was giving me an opportunity to have an experiential faith, right? Something that I could, that I could really hold and put my hands into a, a practice that I could really get involved, that involved my whole body, um, not just memorizing things, not just having the, 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 the right thoughts um, and the right responses and the right answers to questions. So when I came back to go through confirmation class, it felt rigid. It didn't feel like the experience I had with God out in the woods. And I always wondered, why, why couldn't those two match up? Why couldn't we bring things that we did from camp back into our life at church as a child. So I ran with that a lot. That's also part of the, the, the reason and draw for me to go into seminary and to answer God's calling into ministry. Fast forward, seminary's done, working at churches uh, out in Delaware. We get, to, oh no, this is now that I moved to DC. Um, my wife and I head back home um, right before ba first baby is born to visit with my family back home. And we go to the art museum in downtown San Jose and they have a special exhibit that week on mindfulness. Now, this is four, four years ago when kind of this, this resurgence of, of mindfulness and contemplation was, was, was making a big impact in, in, in culture, right? And not just in the church, in culture. So this mindful exhibit um, is on, I don't know what it is, third floor, but it has a line that goes down the stairs and outside the building just to come into this exhibit. And what you did in this exhibit is you would sit in front of a piece of art and you would put these headphones on and a, narr a, a voice, a narrator, were, were, was walking you through what it meant to experience this piece, right? Fully tapping into your, to your senses, what it meant to actually sit and, and experience this from what I say, from your entire spirit, right? From your whole being and not just I'm looking at a picture, I'm reading the one little paragraph on, on, on white cardstock that's next to it that tells me the good information about the artist and about their style and about where they live and the time period. And then it's left up to me to be able to, which still works, to be able to process and experience what I think is happening in that piece of art. So I, I left that exhibit furious, right? I, I left that exhibit thinking that there's a line down the stairs, outside, down Market Street, wrapped around to come in to sit down with the piece to help someone tap into the energy, right? The, 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 the aura, the, the feeling, all the senses that are around this piece of art. This is what we should be doing, right? This is how we should be involving people in the life of the church, that experience, sitting down with something and finding out how the divine is active in everything around us, including all of our senses. This is what we should be doing. So I, I do this hour long rant with my wife back to the, back to the hotel um, about why we should be running, running with, with not, this is not something new, going back to the roots of who we were as the church and how we gathered people together. Now, this kind of shift in, 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 in culture that, that I was seeing live out in this um, art museum in, in downtown San Jose is really not anything new. It's, it's, it's only grown since then, that, that this desire to experience something. I have right here on this wall over here, I have one of these, these mirrors um, that you have a subscription to when it's mounted on the wall and we use it for workouts and exercises. But on there, our meditation classes, right? And our mindful classes. And if you do one live, there's 1300 people chimed in with you, having a facilitator lead you through a mindfulness experience 
on that mirror what the church really should should be doing. So anyway, some of you are probably familiar with um, the work of Phyllis Tickle. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over this because a lot of you probably know it already, that she's kind of captured this, this sense of what's happening in the air right now. This is now 10, 15 years old work uh, from her book, the, the Great Emergence. She calls they're, they're in the church that there's a 500 year rummage sale, right? That a seismic shift happens every 500 years. Not a little tweak. We don't just change the color of the hymnal. We don't update our book of order. A seismic shift in the way we see and process and do everything as a church. That, that's a pattern that's happened every 500 years. So year one, obviously, right? Well, more like year, year, year 33, um, everything has changed, right? The, the Jesus is, is, is now born, present, died, rose, living here amongst us, changing the world, pointing people towards salvation, a whole new way of seeing life of faith. Year 500-ish, right? Roman Empire collapses. The church then is then, is then, is then flung from this kind of really state-sponsored uh, religion at that point. And now we're into the dark ages and, and monasticism. And this, this kind of tapping into the, 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 the divine all around us really starts to blossom. Fast forward another 500 years, the great schism between the East and the West church, right? Huge on to still today on two different calendars, two different ways we, 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 we see things all based on how we interact, how we thought we each interacted with, with the living God. Fast forward another 500 years, 1500-ish, right? The Reformation, which is not an event that happened on one date overnight, but that time period is when it all starts to emerge and we are here now where we are because of because of that and then 500 years ish from that brings us to some point today so in the air is this kind of changing landscape on who we are as the church some seismic shift that's going to happen for us now in the rest of these shifts the majority of them it wasn't like a we, we, we fractured and one then completely went away and, and dissolved, but each split and to, went to do something different to continue to be to go on to the be, being the church. So I imagine that is where we're headed now in this kind of piece that we're in. It's hard to put words to it. You just have to kind of feel that we're something moving and changing in the world today. So I want to put all that out because there's, there's, there are so many studies on, on culture, Western culture and, and, and church of feeling this kind of shift. A recent one that I have just come across that I wanna share with you all today is less about this 500 year kind of shift piece, um, but it is by the, the theologian who used to work at uh, Yale Divinity School, Harvey Cox. He puts church history into three different ages, right? Ages is something, a term we use throughout scripture and, and our faith all the time, the, eight, the age of this, um, the three different ages. So the first age, age one, which is called the age, he calls the age of faith. So year zero to about 400-ish, right? That Christianity was understood as the, the, the life of Christianity was understood as a way of life in fully trusting Jesus, aka having faith in who Jesus was, that, that was centered in faith in Jesus, because the, the story was still very, very fresh and still very new and very exciting at that point. So that, that first age, up until the year about year 400, is what he calls the age of faith. After that, starting around 300, 400-ish, right, we jump into this next age, which is the age of belief. And that extends all the way to about the 1900s. And in this age of belief, what we did as a church was a very good job. We shifted the emphasis onto creeds and beliefs, right? Statements about God, statements of, of a life of what it meant to believe something about Jesus. We wrote thousands, no, millions of pages of paper on things about who Jesus, who the living God among us absolutely was. And that was the anchor to, to much of our faith. And then we are now in a new age, which he calls the age of the spirit, which is more about experience in Jesus. Less about all the, the doctrine and all the statements about who Jesus was, but how is it now we are able to experience this 2,000 year old story? How is it relevant to us today? People are, are desperate to now experience it. They want access to this 
sacred and divine encounter that they find themselves having outside of the institution, right? As he says, the institutional scaff scaffolding. How can then we experience this, this understanding of, 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 of the divine, this mysterious thing that we don't fully know or comprehend. I have tried walking in the doors of a church. Maybe there I will be able to get language about what it is that I'm, that I'm experiencing out on a trail or with my family or on a sunrise, all, all the beautiful things about existence. How can I get some kind of language to help me process this, this natural revelation that I'm having around the world? And what we're finding is that so many people come to these our churches thinking they're going to get those that help with that and, and more direction and, and pointing you closer toward the thing all around them that they can't explain or understand. And they find themselves falling short because we as the church, and I am just as guilty of this, are still living in that middle age, right? The age of belief. We're still very good about the institutional scaffolding. We're still very good about holding up belief and doctrine, those things are helpful, right? They are helpful to point us, but we have then put that in front at the expense of people being able to have an experiential faith. What I ran into when I was 14 years old, from camp to going back home, I was running it, I, I was having this experiential faith moment, and then I was stopped, I, I ran into the institutional scaffolding that wanted me to, to memorize doctrine or to, to understand the, 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 the tenets of the church, which are important. But that was, that was it. That was, that was the, total, the total piece of my faith formation from my church's perspective. And not how can I experience this living, moving, breathing God that's all around me. Um, the professor Kinda Dean, some of you might know, um, Methodist uh, pastor who, who's been a professor for a while at Princeton Seminary, wrote a book a while ago now. Um, she does a lot of youth ministry pieces, and this is now a 20-year-old book. She put in there that the, the emphasis that we have on, on Christian formation, mainly through youth, mainly through our youth, was so much more concern about the lawlessness right? How can we counter the, the, the short term lawlessness in quotes here, the lawlessness of our, of our youth, and let's build our program and structure to help combat that rather than not enough concern about the awlessness of our youth, that they're, that they're not interested in, 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 in tapping into the divine, or they aren't asking questions about that, but have we given them the opportunity and, and, and the space to do that? So where we are, I believe, especially as, as, as Presbyterians in, 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 in this journey, as we come back to, I don't want to say it, uh, back to church, right? Church never left. But as we come back to what our life is going to be like after this pandemic, I can remember myself saying in a meeting with, with Quinn there back in, back in March of 2020 that, that we were going to have um, a very rough ride ahead of us, that, that we were preparing for dozens right, of our churches to say, we're not able to do this and we're going to have to have to turn in our cards and, and, and say, we, we, we've given it a good run, let's, let's, let's honor the work that this church has done before, but we cannot continue on. Uh, we don't have the, 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 the infrastructure to do this. We don't have the technology to do this. We don't have the drive to do this. I thought this was going to be a death sentence for many of our congregations. And guess what? Pretty much all of them but one have proven me wrong, which is, which is a great place to be in, that all of our churches, churches just like national and churches that have 30 people working with them on a Sunday morning, have found a figured out a way to, to help people still process what it means to be the church. And what all of them have done with, maybe some of them have been intentional about this, what all of them have done have helped people reframe their spirituality right? When we take away some of the things that we thought were staples, that we thought the church would not be able to hold it together if we didn't have these things in place, if we weren't sitting together, if we weren't breaking bread in the same space and, and drinking from the same cup, if our voices weren't lifted together in the same room and in the same space, if our children, our youth didn't have a space or a place to go to to help inform their faith, what is it that we are going to do? 
And what, like I said, all of our churches have done, have found a way to be able to still honor what it means to be the church without some of the things that all of us, all of us were convinced were going to be the staples, right? The tent poles that held all of this up. And we can look back now over this past year and a half and see that these churches have done such a better job of tapping into the spiritual life and vitality of their church. Because now it is so much more about experience because it lo it, it's very different for everybody, right? My, my sanctuary, my seat in the pew is different <laughs> than what yours might be outside or on a Tuesday or driving in your car or out on a walk on a Wednesday morning or sitting on your couch or, or watching it late night in bed on your phone. We are all able able to do this very differently than, than we were before. Therefore, we are each having a very different experience than what we did previously pre-pandemic. I want to quickly share with, with you um, a poll that was done by Barna, which does so much very, very good church research data. And this was kind of middle of the pandemic. They did this study on asking people what they missed Go on to, there we go. What they missed about their, their, their church life. And they broke this down into, into the generations, which I love when, when, when things do things of generational. But if you look at these kind of these, 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 these top answers here, I have a second page on this. These top answers here are really all about experiential things, right? Of chances to come and do something that was experiential. I'm so glad that taking communion, the Eucharist, was on the top here, almost all the way across the board per generation, but a good response as something that was missed because that is so experiential. Now, if you look down here, the highest one for millennials, which is my generation, the chance to connect with like-minded people, the experience of being around and being in relationship with people who see the world like I do. Um, that is what, by that generation, was, was missed most. For you, for you data junkies, I'll go to the next page just so you can see some more of the answers on here. And of course, obviously, yes, some of these are, are still considered um, experiential things, but not as heavy of, a, of an experience as the ones that were on that first part of that data. So what I think we are most, what we are, we're headed to of how we as a Presbyterian church can best be an answer to this is that the, the, the core of who we are, right, as, as Presbyterians, is really not about doctrine, right? The core of who we are, I might get in trouble for this, the core of who we are is not what is said inside this book of order or inside of all the beautiful confessions we have about our faith. The core of what it means to be a Presbyterian is to do this in relationship, right? So we only move forward with an idea, with a plan, with a new ministry, if the body, the, 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 the collection, those great presbyters come together to say, yes, we as a body say yes to this idea moving forward, that we're not hierarchical. I, I can't really do anything, right? I don't have much power. Many of you heard me say I, I'm like a bishop without a, without a wand or a scepter or a cool hat. Um, I can't really do anything. Our power lives in the gathering of the people. And I think that is the, the, the angle that we are going to have in terms of what's going to be, I hate to say the word attractive, but what is, what is going to be the, the draw for people who are now ready to have an experiential faith. The root of our faith says that we do that. We process that experience in relationship. We do that among our people. Back on that chart of those Millennials who miss the, the, the thing they miss most was that, was what it meant to be in community. So I hope that as we come back to our, our programs, our missions, our ministries, all the, all the beautiful things of what it is to be the church, we take serious this idea of what it means to experience something. As I open this one with a faith story, I hope many of you have begun to think about what was your calling, right? What, what was the, 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 the hook that brought you into the PCUSA? I doubt, I doubt it was your confirmation class, right? I doubt it was casual per, perusing of, of, of the book of order. I doubt it was um, 
reading an affirmation of faith on a Sunday morning, but it was some type of experience that you can't fully explain, nor I hope you don't try to either, that you can't fully explain of the divine, right? Of the living Christ was moving and breathing and living in everything all around us. The more opportunity we give people to experience that, the more our church is, is, is going to grow because the data shows that people are very, very hungry for that. They know they have experienced something, right? They know they have encountered something that they cannot explain. All, all these Pew Research data points, you know, church is in decline, but what is in what is what is rising is that is people having experience with the divine that they cannot fully understand nor explain. So church numbers are dropping, that number is rising. There is a meeting point in between the two of those that we are on the cuffs of figuring out right now, and that will then help us to be able to grow this church. So national, as, as we come back, as we, as we think about what life is going to be like after this, I invite you to, to put on the lens of how are we helping people experience their faith. We have enough doctrine, we have enough statements, we have enough tradition and history, but how are we leveraging that? How are we using that as our base to help people have an experiential faith as we live into, as um, Harvey Cox said, the age of the spirit? So I, I actually went a lot for four minutes longer than I thought I would. I really hope this is conversational. I, I want to hear questions. I want to have a conversation about this and, and talk about even things we might be doing here at National Presbyt at National Capital Presbytery um, to help our churches be able to, to, to live into this as, as they're coming back. So Quinn, I'm assuming you are Q&A moderating or are we going to tag team that? Although I've got so many questions, I'm not <laughs> sure we're going to get to the Q&A, but I'm going to give folks, we have one in there uh, and we'll get to that uh, in just a second and we'll give folks a chance to put theirs in. Um, but, but John, uh, this is really personal to me, the things that you've been talking about. Uh, and I don't know that you and I have ever had this conversation. But I have a PhD in church history and uh, the history of Christian thought. So doctrine and the history of the church uh, are really important to me. And I, I'm just a little threatened that we <laughs> don't get to keep doctrine anymore and we only have to have experience. However, how did I get to this point? Well, uh, when I was 18 years old, I had an experience of Jesus Christ. It happened in the context of young life, um, but it rearranged my entire world. And I have pretty much spent the rest of my life trying to figure out, well, what happened? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to me? And when I went to the church, um, it, it was not particularly helpful. But I eventually found ways, uh, got into relationships, started studying the Bible, um, got involved in leadership. I did stuff. And then I went to seminary. While I was at seminary, um, the Signs, Wonders, and Church Growth Movement exploded on our campus. People were craving the experience of, well, of speaking in tongues, but more than that, of healing. So it strikes me that there are some traditions, and the African-American tradition is one of these uh, within the church, and the Pentecostal and Charismatic tradition are others who have sort of tapped into experience along the way. Just to finish the story, um, I decided that I wanted to figure out, is there a way to theologically evaluate the appropriateness of some of these um, experiences? And that led me to Friedrich Schleiermacher, who in the 18th century, or late 18th and early 19th century, came to the conclusion in the midst of this movement called Romanticism in Enlightenment Germany, which is pushing back at all the rationalism, he famously said that religion is not a knowing, nor is it a doing, it's a third thing. And he used a word that in English we translate as feeling, and he didn't mean by that emotion. He meant, uh, in some ways, I think roughly the kind of immediate experience um, and, uh, and just something uh, that's that's more than the arid uh rationality of, of just doctrines. Mm. Now, Schleiermacher had all his had problems and he created a debate, but he raised the question, you know, not quite on the 500 year timeline, but that 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 interaction sort of is uh, is still with us. And um, the reformed have 
resisted a lot of that. And, and so it, it, is a, it is a challenge, um, but I think that there is a lot of, uh, of, of pent up longing. I was interested to see that um, those who missed volunteering, the millennials were twice, missed volunteering twice as much yeah. uh, as, as boomers did um, and they were in double digits. And so, you know, that certainly I think is a, very much a concrete and experiential kind of thing. Um, many of us at National are trying to think about living differently, particularly in the midst of um, all that we have been experiencing in terms of racial justice and the, and the need for, uh, for thinking differently you know, we're, we're talking about equity, we're, we're talking about all kinds of things, but, um, and it, it seems to me that, that that is in the realm of something more experiential. Uh, you know, we're not just reading books, we're trying to have conversations, we're trying to be differently uh, about that. And of course, this weekend, um, we had a holiday. Yeah. Um, Who would have thought a year ago, well, a year ago, <laughs> I was just really learning what Juneteenth was. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's all of this stuff going around. And it, so it's more than just sitting in front of, of a painting uh, and listening with headphones on, um, uh, right? And yeah, we, and that on, on the doctrine piece, we, like I said, that, that, that is the foundation, right? We have, we have done that piece well um, to be able to, to help people explain what is happening um, and I, where I think that, that we, we lost a, a piece on this was we, we left it as we, we left it with let's let's figure out and know and understand and get all information about what the faith is. And we lost that piece of the conversation that was the what's next. So then that helps me be able to it, it understand the experiences that I'm having with with the divine. All around me. So I, like I said, I, I think the. The, the, the marriages of, of both of these things, right? The tradition that we have had before, but using that to help people fully live into their, to their, to their experiences. Now, in terms of like the, the, the church traditions that are very heavy on experiential, I still have plenty of questions and doubts about some of those, right? Um, because I don't fully see them leading to a transformational life, right? So great, you have, you have spoken in tongues on your Saturday night, uh, prayer meeting at, 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 at whatever Pentecostal church. Wonderful. If that, if that is helping you tap into the divine beautiful, but if that, if that is not transforming your life going forward for a gospel centered kingdom driven life, that is about what Jesus is, is offering us that I, I have serious question about, about that experience that you had. Um, if it is not then leading you to actually be more like Jesus, Often, and I, this is fresh off the heels of an, an encounter I had in downtown Tacoma Park last night with a, a guy from Sligo Baptist, whatever church, um, that if it is not been transforming you to be more justice oriented, to be more inclusive, to broaden your understanding of God, if it, if it is narrowing you to saying it's either my way or the highway, I don't think that that experience was the living, moving, breathing Christ in you that pointed you toward what what new transformation um, might be like in your life. So I love the, I love the word experience. My, my 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 favorite word to use around the church is relationship. And I see I already see some of these things coming in the Q and A that. What we are seeing now is, is people being in a very different and real relationship with each other and even a real relationship with our history. Um, the fact that so many people are now asking questions and, and want to talk, speak with someone who has a different experience um, from, from, from them, that real relationship, that real encounter between human beings cannot be replaced, right? Um, I, I, I was digging through some, some CON, which is our Committee on Ministry, old doctrine, right? Old, old doctrine in the Presbytery. And we have so many of these policies that are put in place because we don't have relationship, right? If we had a relationship, we wouldn't need this policy to tell us how to, how to better interact with each other. But because we didn't have that relational piece, we had to put something in stone. We had to put a doctrine in place so that we could find a way to connect with each other. So 
for me, the, the root of how we, how we need to do our faith going forward is, is all through the lens of what it actually means to be, to be, to be relational um, with each other and be more relational with, with God, right? The ever moving, living, changing, breathing God all around us. And not just the one understanding that I picked up in at camp, right? Or the one understanding that, that I got back in a, 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 a Sunday school classroom in, in, in the sixties or whatever it might be. How are we evolving our relationship um, and is it growing with what God is doing uh, around us? Right. And just to tie that to doctrine, uh, there's the incarnation that God became like us. Uh, there's uh, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, which uh, as it was renewed in the last 30 years, it's been all about um, the relationality of, of, uh, mm. of the three in the Godhead. All right. To questions. Um, oh. Lewis is the chair of our race task force, graduate of Howard. And so she asks, how do you think the pandemic and all the issues brought to light by Black Lives Matter and, 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 and whatnot have impacted church attendance and impacted uh, what, what uh, I think it was Dr. King said is the most segregated hour mm -hmm. in America? What she said in 1952 or 1962, one of those, I, I, just, I just did something like this and that Numbers have, have gone, even gone the other way, right? Of, of more, it become more segregated than, than they were when this statement was, 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 was first put together. So I, I can speak for, for, for locally, right? Um, that we have, much like Quinn already shared, we have, we have so many of our church leaders who are, who are now diving in, into this, not because they were afraid to before, but because it was just, yeah, the opportunity was never was never really there present for them to say okay i'm going to put this on the top of the on this list so we have a um we have just put into place a a, a training that that we are mandating all of our clergy to go through to help them get another set of lenses to how they look at their leadership of faith through what it means to be an ally and to making sure that they are they are they're factoring all of the pieces that that were put that were blocked by blinders in years past and we have had a great response to these pastors coming and doing this so and now it's relational right they have they have got to have these conversations with people that look different from them that that see things very differently from them and i know that those are going to be those are the the seeds planted now so that in i hope not too long right a couple of years we start to see now churches begin to ask this same question of themselves. We have a couple of our churches who have already started to, to really dive into this and, and do a kind of racial audit of, of their own very short time, time of, of, of being an institution. And then what are we going to do about that? So before some of that work started, our churches around, not just PCUSA, but, but, but around the country who were trying their best to make sure they were invitational and 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 bringing people in who who typically didn't look like who had been in that church for a long time but they weren't really addressing some of those heart issues so a lot of a term that we use a lot is microaggressions right a church that i worked at predominantly white congregation that really was doing their best to to make sure that they were inclusive and inviting of people who look different from them there were still plenty of microaggressions comments that that don't come from a place of malice from someone but directed toward a person of color in that pews that once you get a couple of those there's there's going to be a point where i say okay now this is no different than 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 my work environment now this is no different than my school now this is no different than my neighborhood those are places that i have to go i don't have to come to this church um, so if, if those things aren't being addressed and you are just doing the, the surface level of saying, are the welcome, let's, let's, let's do um, spiritual practices from, from different traditions, let's, let's sing different types of hymns, let's, let's bring in some, some, some different things from other cultures. If we're just doing those things and not examining the heart of the institution, not much is going to change. So right now, because of this unique cocktail that we now live in in the world, people are really starting to be, people and institutions are starting to begin that heart examination um, about 
why are we predominantly white? Why are we predominantly upper middle class? Why are we predominantly boomers? All of those questions, to really examine that question of why, instead of saying, well, we just want people that look different than us. We, we want young people, but not examining the motives as to why you aren't like that um, right now. So I, I think that we are, because of this thing in the air right now, uh, we, are, we are planting some of those early seeds to be in a very different place in terms of what we look like, what we feel like, what we sound like um, than, than we were before. You know, John, I don't know if you know, um, because it's hard when you're only doing Zoom calls uh, in, in, and, uh, in, and in large groups and committees, uh, but uh, National, uh, our session uh, together read a book by John Perkins, One Blood, you're probably familiar with it, mm -hmm. uh, that led to the formation of uh, a race task force um, and who are working on these issues. And they've invited, uh, along with Dr. Rennick, who's on the task force, the, the entire congregation to read One Blood this summer. Um, and then we have a plan to have a small group discussions around it for anybody who wants to the fall. Uh, it's, it's great because uh, we've already got it, oh, I, probably two dozen small groups and several of them are saying, we're not waiting for the fall. Uh, we, want, we want to read it now. So um, it, it's great that, that, that churches um, are, are moving in this direction. D David Mack, who is our uh, resident ambassador, uh, and, um, and, and more, an elder uh, asks this question, U.S. racial politics, higher education, and the Presbyterian Church were impacted by Elder Woodrow Wilson. In this Who, whose funeral was at Central Presbyterian Church um, on 15th and R. No, 15th and what are they on? Irving. Um, Here in the city. Yes. Uh, the well, church we know that has no longer in existence, but that, that's where his funeral service was. was that one in of this words? age of experience, how can we recover from the many bad aspects of that influence while holding on to the good ones? Um, I think being honest about it, right? Um, and not uh, not just hiding it in the closet and, and kind of ignoring that, that, that piece of our history. One of my, my favorite modern theologians is, is Richard Rohr. Some of you might, might have read his, his work before, who is, is he Franciscan? I think he is Franciscan, Franciscan monk. Um, and he does this piece about, about the Reformation, right? And he says, I really wish you all would have reformed us, right? What you did was you threw out everything instead of keeping some of the good pieces um, and the, 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 the contemplative, right? The experiential part, that was not really big in the early part, nor today really, of, of what it mean, meant to be reformed. So we, we tossed out some of the very good things about what it meant to be the church because we were so excited and eager to move away from something that, that, that didn't feel right or that didn't, didn't sit right. So I, I hope that you know, we, we learn from history and that we can, can be honest about those things, name those things that we are saying, this is no longer who we are. And we're not trying to hide it, um, but naming that, right? Re releasing that, those, those, those demons can then help us actually move on to the next phase. Because if you don't do it, people can smell it from a mile away, right? Um, if you don't do it, it is you are, you are not then being authentic about who you are as a gathering of God's people. So I think a first step for that is, is, is naming those pieces, that this is our history. We're not proud of it. Good things still happen in that time period, but let's name some of the pieces that we need to, to, to officially move on from and create space for what we're going to what we're going to, going to do next. So actually three questions uh, that uh, touch on this idea of experience. And I'm just gonna uh, pose them in the order that they've mm -hmm. come. So the first is, uh, does experience mean moving from head to our heart? The second one, um, I've had many spiritual experiences. However, would you agree that biblical knowledge is the key to living a transformed life? Or what is the role of the Bible and knowing the Bible in living a transformed life? Because as you said, um, just having an experience, if you're not transformed, um, that was, by the way, Mark Laberton's point in the dangerous act of worship, you know, when everybody's saying, well, this is, you got to worship in this way, or you got to worship in this way, what's the right way to worship? The right way to worship is the way that changes you yeah. uh, <laughs> in, 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 in biblical ways. Anyway, and then the third one, um, how can your experience help to, or how can our experience help to transform uh, society and, and bring about more peace and unity in the country? 
um, and move forward to, uh, well, to have a great society or at least to have a great church yeah. uh, and to be a credible witness. So experience in the Bible and justice. Yeah. Um, so on that first, that, that, that head and heart piece, um, I don't want to say moving from anything, right? Um, but to expand, right? It, it, is, it is pretty much fully lived in our heads, um, with, which is what doctrine really helps us to do, which is what we need, right? As we're, we're still, we are still thinking rational human beings with cognitive abilities. So we need to process some of this in our brains. We're not moving that work from here into here. We are just broadening the work. Um, so this, this then goes into the um, abundance versus scarcity conversation, right? That, that we can only do one of these things. We got to pick one. No, we can do it all. We can expand how it is that we are, are, are being the church. So we don't have to throw everything away, right? We don't have to, we don't have to stop the intellectual conversations and sermons and uh, adult forms, all the things that we loved before, but how are we expanding that work beyond it just being, this is a very good mental exercise. Um, but what is it doing to then move our entire being, our whole body into some type of action, right? Instead of just, well, that sounded great. And I fully agree with that, or I disagree with that. But now what is it moving in all of you? I've actually processed it here in your head. How is it moving your body, your full being into um, what, 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 what might be next? Um, okay. On this, uh, where's the Bible one? Uh, I have. Um, I, let me just follow up. Yeah. Uh, before I came to Washington, I was in Louisville, and uh, a colleague of mine in, who had been there longer than me made this observation that uh, every year the General Assembly would raise issues, really important issues, issues that needed to be addressed um, and acted on. And so they would form a task force who would have meetings over the course of the next two years, and then they would write a paper and think that they had done something <laughs> and do nothing more. No. And <laughs> which is sort of the reformed way. And, and we're saying, no, we have to, yeah. So yeah. Uh, but the question of uh, the role of biblical knowledge uh, as, as the key to living the transformed life or as the, the, the foundation of living the transformed yeah. life. So what I'm about to say, I know can come across as very heretical. My wife gets on me for this one all the time. Um, that <sighs> is this recorded? Ah, oh, it is recorded, and it's live on YouTube. Uh, okay, that scripture is is very helpful in in pointing us to who God is. But it is possible. It is possible that we would be able to to know who the risen Lord is if we didn't have biblical knowledge. It would be very, 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 very hard, right? And I don't wish that upon any church or any gathering of God's people. But scripture is not the is not God, right? It helps point us to the presence of God. It points us back to, to the actual actions that God did walking, moving, talking here on planet Earth. It is the clearest picture that we have of the work that God's people have done throughout history, but it itself is not God. So it helps us, it helps us to, to, to frame of the experience that we're having, right? Do we see this happening with God's people before, right? Do, is, 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 is this something similar to what we have seen? seen as as people navigate through what it means to be in exile or to be under Roman rule and occupation or to be fully alive in in in, in what it means to be a person of God does it does the action that we are doing now mirror what we have seen God's people do in the past so um back 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 to my my favorite guy Richard Rohr he does he does this piece about Quinn you know this better than I do what's the what's the Latin term for solo scripture, whatever we use. How's it go? Uh, no. Ah, the systematic term about like, we do all this through the lens of scripture. It has, has, starts with the word solo. Solo scriptura. Yes. Okay. So that's how we, we did a lot of things, right? That, that without, without the, 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 the written word, that is the driving force in was for it. But he wants to flip that and say, picture your journey of faith as a tricycle, right? We want to say scripture is the big wheel that keeps us going and in direction. 
but it's really not. It's experience. Scripture is one of the foundational back wheels that hold this thing together, that, uh, that allow the tricycle to be stable and to make sure that it is moving and not wobbling too crazy off, but that it's holding the whole thing together. So one back wheel of the tricycle being scripture, the other back wheel of the tricycle being tradition, and that experience is the big wheel, right? Is the one that is that is pushing and driving us forward, but we are still rooted in in the beauty of what scripture is and, and, the, and the, 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 the finger pointing that it does towards God, right? That, that's, that's directing us always toward the living and breathing God and the tradition of what the saints before us have done as the church, as the collection of, of, of God's people. So it's a long way around of saying that there, there is a way to, to, to incorporate biblical knowledge into an experiential faith. Um, and I think that our our, our, our preachers around this press day right now are really starting to figure what that piece is out, right? How does this beautiful story of Jonah matter for you today? How does this help you understand your experience of the next time you thought you were in the, 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 the bowels of death, right? That you thought that it was, the walls were fully closing in all, all around you. How does, how does God, how is God moving, whatever that was, 4,000 years ago, probably long, long, long time ago, how is that helping frame your experience of what is happening to you with the divine now? So there is a beautiful marriage of, of all of that, but I don't think that it is only going to be memorizing and, and passing exams and making sure you know the, the full arc and history. We need all of those pieces, but how, like I said, how is it helping the rest of this? How is it helping all of this then move move forward in, in, into something else, because at least my circle of, of friends of all my age, who I won't even say two of them, a few of them go to are involved in the life of the church and what they want to do when, when I go visit them or they come and visit me, we sit in the backyard with a bottle of whiskey and we talk about the life of faith. And they ask all these Bible questions that they've never got to ask before, right? Have never been unpacked for them before. And they're like, this is great. Why, why, how come I don't know this? How come this, this, this way of, of hearing this story or how scripture can be used this way? How come that was never, never presented for me? I don't have a really good answer, but I know that people are very hungry for that, for that style of, of biblical knowledge and, and understanding that why does any of this matter? And, and, and how, how beautiful can it be? How expansive and how broad and how inclusive can it be? Um, rather than just, well, I mean, the, my, my least favorite term is the Bible is very clear. I was like, the Bible's not clear about anything, guys. Um, I, nails on a chalkboard here, somebody said, well, the Bible's clear about, 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 this certain topic. Um, so yeah, I think the marriage of all of those, which is this experience, right? How are we helping people experience the Bible and not just understand it, right? Not just fully comprehend it inside our heads, but how are we experiencing um, scripture? That is, that is, that's, 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 that's still breathing, right? That's still, that's still moving and alive. And, and, and well, So you talked about experience and you talked about its relationship. And um, I mean, the way that I have, tried to put it together, uh, particularly for uh, my adult education committee. And, and for national, scripture is really important. Um, but uh, it's, it's Jesus who is really important. And yeah. <laughs> it, you know, is the experience of God that we have because of who Jesus is, both individually and as the church. It's not just any type of experience. Um, you know, I, it, it doesn't matter if we ever go to an art museum or, or, or have a mindfulness encounter about, about something generic, but for the church, it's, uh, it's what gets us to Jesus and yeah, yeah. scripture and doctrine do that. But there are plenty of people who know the Bible and doctrine better than me, who are not the least bit interested in Jesus. No. <laughs> so that's the point of the church. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and then in terms of how this transforms society, mm. Moving and moving forward, this experience. How does, um, you know, your uh, your dream of uh, the kind of church that that we have, where people experience, how does that then uh, bear witness in, in the public square? I mean that um, I I I hope that it looks like the 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 the, the church of Acts at that point, right? Um, that it fully moves away from 
the position of, of privilege that the church had 60 years ago because of its, because of culture, right? Culture said that church was important and not church saying that transformation in, in your life was important. You might have gotten that message, but it would, the, the driver to why you were involved in a life of church was, I wouldn't say only, but a huge por portion of it was just American culture, right? You, you, you went to church. That's that's long been over, right? That's that's been over my my entire life. That that is that is long gone. Some of us are still finally discovering that that we no longer sit in that position of of privilege that we had before, and so much of our structure is still built on that way of 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 being the church that was driven by culture. So now that has changed. How then can we help people help reverse it? How can we help people navigate through the ever changing culture, right? What is what is the foundation that we are then offering people to help them navigate through 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 life that is going to be evolving and changing all the time? Um, I think that that's where that's what the church started out as. And that's what I hope that we are we are beginning to to reclaim. Um, and not that not that this is like, you know, uh, my you know, big thing for me is is this this push to like make sure you say the the special prayer and learn the secret handshake before you die or guess what or else that we move away from things like that and we say how are we helping you encounter the gods so that you are transformed and that so that the world then um, is is transformed also because the the work of Jesus that we see in the New Testament is still to this day very different than any of the very good meaning justice driven conversations and those 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 leaders in our culture who have who have done a very good job about about shifting that conversation especially around justice it, they 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 come from that faith background right um so reclaiming what that is going to be and how we then as the church make sure that the narrative that 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 we know of who Jesus is is central um, in our conversations about how the world is going to move and change and transform, um, and not it just being left up to policy, politicians, um, laws being passed, new holidays being created. But how are we helping to frame that conversation about that this is still the the, the work of the living God? all around us that is constantly pointing, like MLK said, bending us back toward that, that, that moral arc that points us toward this, this wholeness that God has promised for all of us. Okay, we've got two questions left. I'm gonna combine them. All right. And when you're done, uh, I'm gonna ask you to pray for this congregation uh, it, as, as our general presbyter. Um, so uh, our congregation, heck, our denomination, <laughs> a large portion of older than boomers, right? 50% uh, of our uh, congregation is probably uh, older or in the older uh, uh, demographic. We're heading for the next great uh, revelations. Um, what did the survey find out about us? <laughs> um, and, uh, and maybe we should be uh, talking about uh, the kinds of things um, that you know, we mentioned this morning. And then secondly, what can mm -hmm. national, a predominantly white church in a very diverse city do to differentiate from what is going on um, everywhere else? Um, so yeah, that, that, that first piece of that, that's, that's now also true. The, the evangelical church is now in the exact same footsteps that, that we, that the mainline church was in was in 20 years ago and they are not no longer they are no longer growing in 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 younger numbers but this kind of uh adult lunch and opportunity so when i was when i was pastor at, at, at northminster which is a predominantly african-american congregation right at the top of the diamond outside downtown silver spring the my favorite thing which i still think was everyone's favorite thing of my ministry there was not all the you know cool ideas i wanted to do but was a storytelling service right a sunday morning storytelling service where the entire service was built around people sharing their their stories of faith and we had a sixth grader and we had a 80 86 year old right five different people throughout the, and 
you want to talk about no dry eye in the sanctuary. You want to, people who, who have sat next to, to somebody in a pew for 50 some odd years and have never heard them talk about their faith this way. So it is not just people my age. My, it, 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 is, it is around the board that we have not given people the opportunity to really share that experience, that, that the things that they have had that have impacted and transformed their life. Now, some of those are probably a, a a great soul that was sung inside the sanctuary, right? Or a, a thing the pastor said this one time that from a sermon that that put on a new set of lenses for me going forward. But how we need to be giving people more opportunity to do a testimony, right? To share, this is central to, to, the, to the early church, right? To share how the living God was moving in their life. We have, we have completely gotten away, disappeared from that. Aside from your coming into the church, and I'm going to say yes, I do, to a couple of these statements. I might answer one or two questions with a session when I'm being examined about this, but that's about it. How are we helping people to, to share their faith? Because once they're able to do that, guess what? They can go back and do it in their communities. They can go back and do it at their workplace. They can go back and do it to their schools. And then that is invitational for me to then come and join you with your life of faith, because I, had, I, I know you, I trust you, I see that it has transformed and changed your life going forward i also want a taste of that that's contagious that is that that's that's evangelism that is going to work to help us grow the church and it works for all generations right everybody has a story they can share about what god has done in their life recently that is not a new thing that is not a thing for only my to, to my generation we need to provide that opportunity for everyone to be able to do some of that and then that would then lead into um this this conversation right the the Predominantly white church in, 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 in a very diverse city. Well, welcome to all of our churches that aren't that aren't black churches in, 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 in inside our presbytery. How is then this very different from what's happening in workplaces? We're honest about it, right? We we are now in a relationship. I trust you. I have I, I I know who you are. So now I can't, it's not an article, right? It's not a uh, a post that someone shared that I can immediately disagree with and start typing up reasons on Facebook of why this is so wrong. But I have sat with you. We have we have prayed together. We have broken bread together. I now he am hearing your story. It is so hard for me to then discount that. So that work of making it different than than workplaces and communities and all that is because we are intentional about what it means to be in relationship with each other. And that starts with trust, right? That starts with actually getting to know each other, hearing each other's stories and sitting with what might feel uncomfortable for, for, for some of us, but trusting that that person is, is, is also a child of God who has been called to do this work of what it means, what it means to be the church. John, thank you. Uh, this has been terrific. Uh, really appreciate your leadership and, uh, and your ministry with all of our churches, but especially national. And um, would you just, uh, as we finish, would you pray for us? As yes, indeed. Loving and beautiful, merciful God, we thank you so much for the privilege and the honor of what it means to be the church, to be a gathering of people who are eager and excited to listen to where you are calling us next knowing that our position right now is not the full picture. It is not complete. Our completion comes as we continue to follow what you have called all of us to go and be and do, to reflect your light, your love, your justice, your word of truth to every corner of this earth. We thank you for the unique congregation of, of National, that they have been an authentic witness to your gospel, to your love to this portion of DC and to the corners of the world that ministry is now able to touch and reach. We thank you for ears that have gathered here today, um, for hearts that are excited about, about what experiential faith means next, and for our heads, for our brains to help us to be able to process and to think about this, about what it might mean for us in the church. We also pray this morning words of, 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 of wisdom and knowledge and truth from Quinn as he prepares to preach to your people this morning. Might his words be received and might it draw and push people to action with their whole being. We pray all this in your amazing and beautiful name. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, friends, for joining us. We will see you all next time. Righty. See ya.